Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is another in the series of conversations with artists which Quest Gallery sponsor. And I know we are very few tonight. Um, I was lucky I had two godmothers. One was a very grand Scottish lady. The other was a very fast living South African ballerina. And both of them said to me, don't stint when the hall isn't filled. So I hope yeah. that we will have a good session this evening. The ballerina was perhaps more emphatic on this than the grand dame. Anyway, <laughs> so here is Martin Yeoman, whose works you see on the walls. And I'm here to ask him some questions and to throw around a few ideas and to invite questions from you at the time. Um, before, Martin, before I start questing you, yeah. I would like to give you a, a quotation which I think is terribly interesting. Um, it's from the art critic and the historian James Elkins from his book the object stares back on the nature of seeing. I think that being the title itself is interesting, the object stares back. And he says, art is one of the experiences I rely on to alter what I am. Art is one of the experiences I rely on to alter what I am. I think these are words that we need to keep with us each time we cross through the threshold of a gallery. But conversely, I also think in that art not only can alter what we are, but can also confirm what we are. And I want to start off by asking you, so of, when I was looking at your portraits, I found some of the most touching ones, those of your son. They are they're very poignant, they fill with the parents' vulnerability and love. But I was thinking, what does this say about your childhood? Um, I don't think they, I hope they don't say anything about my childhood. I, um, what, what I think when you're painting someone's portrait, or you know, and you're painting someone you love, basically, whether it's your, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's your wife or your child, or, and there's someone that you really know, or your father, or your mum, or your brother, or, you know, you, you, you're very, very that portrait of your father is a particularly striking one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's. Um, See, you've had a chance to look at these people uh, in every aspect, and that's very, very different to when somebody's come along and say, "Ask you to paint them." So you, you, so you've got that as a as an advantage because they're there. They, you know, they, you know, when people, are, when you, when you get asked to paint somebody, you know, you, you'd like. To to, to do what you do with your the loved ones, really. But um, it's never going to happen. But there are also the people, not necessarily those who ask you, but those who you spot that, that yeah. Lady Margaret in the restaurant. Yeah, she was, she was marvellous. And a nat natural fact, I think. I um, don't know if people know this, this, this portrait is... One, you, I believe you were having a meal with your son and yes. you saw this lady yes. and you thought there's a living Rembrandt yes. in a Morrison's yes. cafe. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And, and she was so open and wonderful. I mean, she didn't sort of mock the idea straight away as most people would or put up resistance to being painted. She just said, yes, you know. <laughs> and, um, and she felt very at ease about that. Whereas most people, you have to kind of convince, you know, well, why do you want to paint me, you know? <laughs> you know, what's he after? Um, 
horrible. We can't just, we're yeah. jumping around. I mean, I've got to make quite a bunch of it. And talking about my son, um, I don't know. Um, I don't think it says anything about me. I hope, I hope not, anyway. Um, I've always liked, when I was a kid, I, I really liked sort of drawing faces and I used to make them up. Mm. And I used to think, oh God, that looks like Florence Harvey, you know, if you remember. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and I used to think, God, that really does look like Florence you know. Harvey. Um, and I used to sort of make things up and then I used to draw my friends when I got a little bit older. And, and then and then I really got into doing portraits um, when I was in India in uh, 1973. Well, what I find interesting is in that Hindustan to Malabar, yeah. Tim McIntosh speaks of, and he's really is giving you some ego massage. He speaks <laughs> of, it. you need it. <laughs> he speaks of your humility and devotion with which you approach whatever you are painting or drawing whether it be the Taj Mahal or a teapot. Yeah. And I think that's a, a compliment that's worth cherishing. Yeah, it is. And it is. in some things that you say, you would feel that you have learnt from the people you are drawing, you are the people who are the subject of your portraits. Well, I think one of the, one of the things, you know, I, I mean, I went off to India when I was uh, 20. Um, and the, the pull was to go to the Himalayas, actually. Um, and I, you know, friends of mine said, let's all go to the Himalayas. And uh, I used to like going to the Lake District, so I thought, oh, that's, uh, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, yeah, I did go to the Himalayas. And I'm, but in the end, it's the people of all these places that the interaction, the people you meet, and the, those chance meetings that mm -hmm. are greater than the wonderful mountain ranges that we, you know. I mean, remember when I was up in Kashmir, in the Pakistan Kashmir, in Hunza. And as, I know Hunza, it's going, that's yeah. where the wonderful apricots come from. Yeah, from. that's right. And there's, um, you know, and it was, uh, you know, apparently people lived to a very old age there. And there were sort of throwbacks of Alexander the Great, and you know, there was a lot of ginger haired people there, um, ginger beards and ginger hair, and, and it wasn't henna's, um, and pale skin. Um, but I remember being there, and I was on my own, and I was thinking, God, if only I had somebody here to share this with. And then you, then you realise that actually, if you were with someone else, you probably wouldn't have actually got there. <laughs> to have shared this thing with yeah you know, yeah because you know, nobody thinks we don't all think the same we can't think as you know even your friends you want to share everything with in the end you you, you come to these places on your own but the funny thing is um i remember about hunza um i i i think i've done a lot of traveling because it's a way of trying to reconnect with um, our part, my past, or my father's past. And, and funnily enough, up in Hunza, I remember looking down, sitting up on a hillside and watching the school uh, outside, and there were all the dead, all the children sitting there, and they all had chalk boards, you know, drawn drunk, 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 drunk. And they all had a little tuft of hair at the front. And, and the teacher pulled them up, smack around the back of the head. And um, that's what my dad told me that was like him when he was a kid. So it was quite nice to sort of, um, you know, see, actually, it was a lot of things that he grew up with that mm -hmm. still were still living like in, in parts of Pakistan. Yeah. You know, it's, it was really amazing. amazing, actually. I in a few moments that I had to speak to Martin before this public performance, I was saying to him how sorry I am that there aren't more of his sketchbooks on the internet, because I think those are ravishing. And I was wondering, 
Yeah. If there are um, landscape uh, drawers of the landscape, modern ones who you admire, I am a great proponent of the Australian artist Freddie Williams. I don't know. I'm sorry. Martin, do yourself a favour and well, everybody else here yeah, too. <laughs> he is yeah. such a great. Yeah. Uh, it, he's got a pencil and the Australian landscape. Mm. Put him into Google. Yeah. I put you into okay. Google. Yeah. I got Richard. Put Freddie yeah. Williams yeah. into Google. Are there, are there? Because sometimes we don't know who's out there as well. I mean, yeah. you, you get told who's good in the art world and. And of course, the, the trouble is about being told who's good is you go to them with a, a slight, uh, with a bit of scepticism, actually, you know, and probably quite rightly so, especially when you're told that this person's great. <laughs> and, uh, and you think, well, great in what respect? And, uh, you know, because I think the great artists, actually, I don't think there's any great artists around, but I do know there have been great artists. And uh, that's just as important. You know, I mean, the contemporary world is a very different thing. So it's nice to know if there's someone, you know. Well, I mean, you might not agree with me. I might me, not agree with you. But I do think, yeah, I it would be good do to think yeah. you should have a look at yeah. Freddie Williams. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can imagine he draws trees. To, I'm sorry? Does he draw trees? or just, is Lots of wattles and pines, yeah. yes, but... It's the it's it's I I'm not going to blather no, on no, about no. Freddie. This is no. my thing. I think you should have a look because yeah. exactly as you know yeah. when I went to the website and pulled you up, though I'd seen many of your much of your work, I mm. it was also a pleasure. But it's um, I mean I do look at the past, the past drawings because to me they're as alive and as good as, as if they were just done. You know when when you see a drawing from by a constable of trees, just think, bloody hell, how did he do that? How did he do that? You know, and it's not an easy thing to do, is it? To draw a huge tree in all its, all its detail, you know. I think it's just incredible. Um, without, and, and, and a beautiful drawing as well. Um, and recently I saw a little drawing by um, Delacroix, and I thought, you could have actually thought it was a Van Gogh for the way he'd drawn it. And, you know, he must have, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that Van Gogh would have seen that, but bloody hell, you would have thought it was I think Gogh. they should send you out to many of the current art schools and mm. for you to get on a soapbox and talk I'm about the to. primacy oh. of drawing. Because, yeah. I mean, it's, it is a, and it's it, something uh, that you could beat a many drums on. Well, I think, that, I think the thing is about drawing is that there isn't a one particular way of drawing, but there is a, because the, there's many, many truths, aren't there? And there's many ways to draw. Um, and there isn't a, I mean, I remember when I was younger, uh, you know, you, I know that you paint, and is that, um, you know, this idea of drawing properly would have probably killed me. It's, it's later on that you want to, to do these things. You know, if it's, a, oh yeah, but you know, really, you, you want to really be doing a drawing like that constable tree and you just go, yeah, how do you do that? You know, and you'd probably just get bored and you'd give up and you'd be defeated. Do you uh, but I think later on, as you get more, when you really realise what it's about, then you start looking at these people, and then you see how good they are, and then you, you sort of, they, they get better and better and better, and they stop, and they don't stop getting better. The great ones still remain great. You know, it's nothing to do with fashion, I don't think. Now I'm going to present another of your sayings that you uttered aloud in the public domain. Let the style mm. come out of the looking. Mm. That I think is intriguing. I mean, perhaps you could take 
one of your uh, one of the paintings here to illustrate that. I mean, which of the, uh, these are well, probably the easiest to see. Which would you like to talk about? Well, that's a, a little bit of a deceptive thing because um, let the star come up here. I mean, I I tell you why I said that. It's because when I was twenty, you know, nineteen, eighteen. All that sort of people say, oh, your style, everyone talks about style. What's your style? Are you going to do this style? Are you that style? And, that. and, then, and you get kind of sidetracked into this, this notion that you have to have a style. And actually, your, the way that your work becomes, comes out looking in this way of what I meant. Yeah. But, but, having said that, it's probably come out looking at really other people's work. <laughs> uh, so um, I like Brabazon Brabazon, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm sure there's a little bit of that there somewhere. And uh, um, the Bullocks I like very much, um, especially that one, because there's hardly anything there. But really, what... what what then, then, then just take that up. You like that because there's hardly anything there. Yeah, but to me it's all there. To me uh -huh. it's all there. But the difficulty about that is, is you, if you sort of look at, because they are really done in studies, they are, it's something that was happening that you, I really wanted to see and have been driving from Kajaral back to Orchard and was looking for this very subject and there because it reminds me of the 19th century french uh-huh yeah yeah i mean yeah you know, you know everything everything <laughs> everything you do reminds you of things you've seen in a way you know i mean you can't it's not you haven't invented it you haven't you know you've really your ideas come from other people. It's, you know, it comes from other... It's not only coming from, it's also as if I do think you are actively involved in the dialogue with artists like Caro and Sickert. Yeah, I mean, I wish I... I you know, they're, I mean, they're my the, heroes. <laughs> yes, yeah. oh, well, I'm, I'm just... You know, but I mean, they're, you know... Um, and if you look at those people, that's where... It, that's where you get, you know, that's where it comes from, isn't it? You know, you see something and it suddenly, I mean, I, I was walking, how was it? I was walking a dog today and yeah, he was on a lead and then there was a guy on the other side of the road and he had a Doberman and he was, he, the Doberman wasn't on the lead. And you know, this little, little Jack Russell probably could have been eaten. Yeah, but they actually don't... Know. You were walking the Jack yeah. Russell. Yeah, Jack Russell on the lead, you know, so I'm thinking, uh, I wish his dog was on the lead, and I'm trying not to get too tense about this. Anyway, there was a whole group of people. There was him on one side of the road, and there was this young family, uh, and a woman pushing a push chair, and these other people. And I tell you what, all their faces looked like the Millet uh, 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 sort of farm workers. You know, they had that sort of, they had that look, you know, that sort of... Oh, those peasants beaten down. Those, yeah, but these, they, the funny thing was, they weren't peasants that were beaten down, and probably, you know, um, doing rather well on... Of course. On, <laughs> on social services, you know. And, uh, uh, but there was a subject. And also, you could think, God, you know, Damien would have loved that, you know. This little group, this little group of people coming down, you know, this ragged lump of people, you know. And the guy on the other side of the road, it was quite so cheerful, you know. I mean, he really controlled that dog, so I had to admire him for that. You know, the dog didn't race across the road and eat Monty, you know. Uh, and I admired him for that, that he could really control his dog, and he was confident about this, this position that he had. But these other group of people were. They were pretty savage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was also Dunia. Indeed. Now can I ask you a question about... You said that when you were at the Royal Academy Schools, they 
allowed you to do still life, still lives on sufferance. Your well, I had to do still lives. Yes, yeah. but your your initial non eagerness should be diplomatically yeah. said. Yes, yeah, I didn't like still lives. I've, I've only recently realised the uh, the benefits of still lives. If they did. Your teacher said. You'll learn a lot from them, and you have said that you did. Yeah. Now, what have you learned? Sort of spatial juxtaposition, yeah. Mirandi-like things. Well, I think uh, one of the things that Greenham said to me, he said, "Look, just have a have a have a still life set up, you know, anywhere, any any you know, couple of things you like to look at, and just let it be there, so you can come to it any time, you know." The, first thing in the morning. So that's why I, how come I painted that, uh, that car. And it's, it's amazing. It's amazing how wrong you go all the time. <laughs> so if you think things define you, and you think, well, actually, I've got all the values completely wrong. And everything is completely wrong all the time. And so you keep going at it, keep going at it. But, you know, it sort of tunes your eye in. And these are lessons yeah, you have learnt yeah, from that on suffer and still life well, painting. Funny enough, um, when I was doing that painting, I mean, all the lessons of about 40 years ago are very strong in the brain. And you just think, I've had really been fortunate to have been properly taught. And you do pay your teacher, Peter Greenham, a great compliment. Well, he deserves Because it. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, he's... He's actually, he's there, um, not saying, oh, don't do it like that, oh, don't do it like this, or but he's there, all those, the, I mean, it's taken me a long time to actually put him in his proper place, you know, um, uh, because he was a bit too sort of there, you know, I mean, he didn't want to be there, it was my fault, you know, That's, that was me taking it wrongly. Um, you know, I almost became, I mean, I did this portrait at the same time as my dad's portrait. Of, uh, mm -hmm. There was an old Jewish landlord who lived nearby, and he had a fantastic head, and I thought, oh, you know, go away in here. And I, I put, I had the two, and they were very, very different. There was one of my dad, which was, you know, I think uh, the curator of the Royal Academy School said, oh, that's rather photographic. and. Uh, and this other one that was rather Peter Greenish, you know. and uh, and uh, that one's the much better one. That's uh, that's a better one. Anyway, so I put it into the summer shed, and unlike today, where I can't get anything in there, then um, I I got uh, I got the painted it. it was in gallery number one. It's in the, because actually they thought it was by Peter Green. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, one of the RAs actually went up to Peter Green and was actually congratulated him on his portrait. <laughs> well, that must have been a, a pleasant feeling for him. Well, it, it, it was all wrong. <laughs> it's, all, <you> know, <laughs> it's, it's sad. But, you know, look, the thing is, I think if you, if you want to learn from somebody, I think you do have to... And I think it's about learning, actually. I think it's about risking your talent somewhere along the line somewhere along the line you have to put all this sort of these ideas that you've got this talent you have to risk it you have to you have to risk it in order to learn and you have to put these things to one side and say okay you know i'm happy to learn you know if it goes all wrong now because i found things much easier before i was taught yeah but then i you know i i you know, I left school at 16 and did commercial arts, so that actually kind of screwed everything up. You know. Did it screw things up, I mean? Yeah, it did, actually, yeah. It it did. Beyond the fact that it does. I'll reveal yeah. that one of his images appeared on a Selfridges shopping bag. Yeah, yeah it did. How did it screw things up? Well, it, it, um, I remember sort of thinking, I wish I could meet someone who could really draw. You know, um, everyone, we had this thing called a Grant Protector which is a huge, great machine that you, you put something underneath the photograph or something like that and you put, you know, you could enlarge it or shrink it and just traced it out. And uh, I thought, I don't want to use that. 
I want to do it with my hands. <laughs> it's it pathetic, really. But it was the only way of keeping a sort of, you know, from sort of falling asleep. Because actually, I knew commercial art wasn't for me. You know, I mean, I'm not. There, there are people who were at that time in the 70s who were br absolutely brilliant. From you've gone to the Royal College, you you know they haven't even got a job now. There's no need for these people. But they were absolutely. I can tell you, they were absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I can still remember some of those people coming into the studio with their work, trying to get work, and the kind of the quality of watercolor that these people could do is just was amazing. You know, and. We've sort of, you know, with, with the age of computers, that's all gone. It's, it's, it's you know, what's, what's needed with these people? Everyone's sort of gathering their images all sorts of ways. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, so it must have affected a lot of other people as well. I can't believe it didn't. It must have. You know, and the, why, why I'm doing the sort of things I'm doing now is that the seventh? I mean, I could have gone in, off in another direction, I suppose. Um, you know, doing commercial art and then doing your work in the evening, and you know, I was quite abstract and sort of making up things as I went along and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but after a while, I kind of got to a dead end with it, and I just wanted to sit down and draw things and. And it started from, from, you know, that's what I did as a kid. Mm -hmm. and I sort of came back to it sort of late, late teens. And um, I'm really glad I, I've done that because I don't feel it's been a waste of time. And I do think that, you know, you know like, um, uh, who's the man who did the portrait of Flea? Was it uh, Blake? Blake, yeah. Blake. I thought with Blake had an amazing imagination, imagination. It was on fire, really. And all his work came from his imagination. And then it sort of finished. And I think when you're working with uh, abstract ideas and making up things, you, it's all the things that have been fueled, all the things you've seen, it's all coming out somehow, those things are all coming to do, to play with this, to play with that. But, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that I sat down and sort of, you know, I, I felt embarrassed about it at first, because all my friends were doing sticking uh, stamps on canvases, you know, and loads and all. And I said, well, what's that you doing? Oh, well, these, this, this is going to be something where all the letters I have, I'm going to take off the stamps and I'm going to put them on this canvas. And, you know, and you know, do loads of anything, yeah, that's good. And you think, yeah, no, why am I doing that? Martin, are there any very contemporary artists whose work you enjoy? No. When does the line get drawn? I think it's the 19th century thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I. Um, I, I mean, I like. Uh, <laughs> William Nicholson, you know, you know Edwardian, uh, Edwardian painting, bloody amazing. Um, but contemporary works, yeah, it's hard. I mean, Greenham was was someone who, and I don't want to actually. I don't really want to work like him. But it's something about because his work is about touch, and I. And I think there's something really essential about this idea of touch, actually, of where, where you touch, uh, you know, a point of a pencil on a particular type of paper or surface or whatever, and it's touching with colour on a surface, and it's to do with touch. I think it's all to do with touch, actually. Have you seen this? Wonderful exhibition that's on at the British Museum, the Ice Age Art Show. Well, there you are, you see. That's, that's, I know. When you talk about, you know, the touch, the incision, yeah. the mark yeah. made, yeah. it makes me think of some of those incredible oh, yeah. things made 40,000 oh, years yeah. ago. Yeah, they're marvelous. And they're absolutely marvelous. And they're marvelous because 
you know, they had no concept of art. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the marvellous thing about them, that, I, you know, they're, it's they're been extended for a week, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. I just wish I could sort of drag you and put yeah. you in front of yeah. that I've vitrine seen, yeah. that has this, the oldest, one of the oldest instruments, musical instruments, a, a flute, flute. Yeah, a flute made from the a, a wing bone of a griffin vulture, which yeah. can do the top half of our modern diatonic scale. Yeah. A beautiful object. From there I went to collect and saw everything that was being done by you know, computer editor Dijon. Dijon. But well, I saw one, one, you know, they had a, a very small exhibition a few years ago in the British Museum, and it was a lot early, very, very, very early things by man. Mm -hmm. And there was this marvellous uh, carving of two deer crossing the stream, crossing <gasps> the river. I, it's just, I, I was with my son and I took him to see this thing and it just, I mean, it's just bloody amazing. You know, it's not crude. <laughs> it's really... It's in, it, it was in this current yeah, exhibition. It would be, yeah. And what... This I mean, you know, somebody, there's this person who was sitting on the side of the river had been watching the radio swimming, swimming across. The and tragic thing, to this thing. Um, Martin, I'm going to interrupt you here, because I'm as voluble as you are. Sorry. The tragic <laughs> thing was the replicas which the, the BM, the British Museum were flogging in the shop of these things. Mm. There was, and they were, you know, 150, 200 pounds a pop. The ones of the swimming reindeer were a travesty. It was a degradation. Also, there was a lion man who was very funny. We were wandering away a bit, but yeah. that statement you said about making a mark took me back to these, well, funny to enough, these I, people. I don't want to sound, um, you know, sort of um, pretentious, but I think I'm going to. <laughs> it's always a risk when runs in arts situations. Yeah, um, I'm, my first sensation of drawing was when I was a, a really, really young, I don't know how old I was, but, you know, probably three or four or something like that. And it was in the days when you didn't have emotional pain, you had distemper. And there's something about, something crystalline about distemper, isn't there? So I had this teddy bear. And I'm not a teddy bear person, but anyway, I had this teddy bear. And it, what do you mean you're not a teddy bear person? You were four years old. I know, but I didn't like them. I oh, really? Like, I didn't like, anyway. Cusses even at that age. Yeah, yeah. Really horrible, actually. Uh, and this teddy bear had a, a hard nose. And I remember I was lying on this, it wasn't my room, it was my sister's room. And it's a slightly pink wall, and I was drawing with this nose. And that sensation has stayed with me ever since, actually. And uh, I, I was really happy until my mum saw it. And then, you know, of course, they weren't very happy at all. But it, it's that beautiful, there was a beautiful line. And you're aware of it right from very mm -hmm. early on. Well, it's the line in your yeah. drawings, that, that, that new downstairs, that lovely liquid line of the... Of, of her body would just seduce well, one, me. One of the things that Greenham really helped, actually, he said, because obviously I did a, a, a line before I went to the academy, and, uh, and I, you know, basically got their attention by by my drawings, you know, which I sort of done, you know, without any anyone else's help. Um, but he would say, you know, be very careful of the easiness of a line, mm -hmm. you, know? Mm -hmm. you know, and you would always use this, uh, you know, a lot of people don't sort of believe this to be true, though, but uh, Holbein, you know, everyone says, oh, that marvellous line around the face, and I say, oh, you know, everyone says it's a marvellous line that goes around the face, and actually it's a line that's made up of lots and lots of lines, because it's finding, the, uh, there is no edge, you know, you're finding this edge around the form. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was about searching out from the middle of the form 
to the outside. So, yeah, I mean, I remember being taken to a by, by my art school teacher um, when I was 15 to Hopper's first show. And had lots of line drawings and, um, of, um, you know, men lying on beds and stuff. And he said, this man is a, a great craftsman. And, you know, being 14, 15, you know, what do you say? You know, but I remember I, it stuck with me. I, I still don't see it, actually. I still don't see that those are such great drawings. When you're drawing in situ, so to say, and when you're painting in a studio, what is for you the difference? The difference what? between drawing in a situation, you know, making an actual drawing in your sketchbook, which I don't know whether you will use that or whether it will be a different scene which you, in your studio, when you paint a, a landscape. I'll tell you what has been really surprising is that when you're drawing out out in life you're less conscious about how you're drawing and then mm -hmm. suddenly you become horribly self-conscious uh, when you're in a drawing studio or you know in front of people or you know someone says can you draw me you know and it's um, you know, all of a sudden, there's no, no reason on earth why you want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> and um, I always had a difficulty with that, actually. I remember when I was in Pakistan, drawing people in the street, and just finding them maps. I mean, they were like Rembrandt's and Leonardo's, and they were there, and they were doing all these things, and just... Didn't, Oh, yeah, oh, this is fantastic. It was Tintoretto, there was everyone, you know, all for your, just for you to draw. I'd, I mean, I didn't know a Delacroix then, but apparently it's how Delacroix felt when he went to, yes, when he went to when North he went Africa. To North Africa, he just couldn't believe yeah. it, you know. And um, I know how that feels. And then, I mean, and then you want to earn some money, and somebody says, Oh, wow, well, I know a very rich man who, you go and draw his portrait, and you go, you leave the street with all this, and then you go up to this air conditioned office, and um, there's this very nice man sitting there. And you can almost hear the clock go tick, tock, tick, and you think, oh, it's not easy, this is it. And it's always been a problem of how to keep things alive, because a joy, uh, I think. I think really art is about life, not the other way around. And, and like that man who was sitting on that riverbank looking at those reindeer drunk. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's I'm that. so glad we've got that sort of touch point of the yeah, reindeer. Yeah, I think it. I mean, we don't know why people drew on the on the walls, um, but pretty amazing. Yeah, they're just amazing, and. Uh, but again, you know, they had no concept of art. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they knew it because they were drawn on the lumps and bumps on the walls, and those lumps and bumps were suggesting horses' heads or lions and stuff, you know, things outside. Uh, but bloody hell, they are pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> pretty Do you and it's amazing that they're still there, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's one of the things I love about, you know, looking at work from, say, 500 years ago even. The fact that it's still there. Mm -hmm. And you go up in front of that, to that portrait and you think, to me, that person's alive. You know, a really great portrait is alive. You know, that person is still alive. And I never, ever, ever get that sense when I look at photographs. Don't oh, you? No, I always look at the photograph and think, oh, that person died, you know, sort of 150 years ago. Or something. You know, they're not, you know, but I don't feel Gosh, that way. No, if we had more time, I'll take you up on that one, but I don't think it's a 10 or off nine. Do you know where, which landscapes you'll next be drawing? Do you have any proposed trips? No, I, I think I'll probably be working in, in, in England. I do like, mm -hmm. I do like England. I mean, I, 
you know, I mean, I think, I think, I've run away from, from England because I didn't really like it and I didn't really like how, um, how every, because I think uh, for someone of my generation, we've seen um, such phenomenal change uh, in the landscape. And, and it made me feel really sad and actually a little bit sort of jealous actually that people like Stanley Spencer could grow up in a landscape, go to Ock College and go back and the landscape was still there. Uh, and Constable walking his childhood paths, you know, he walked those as a child <coughs> and then yeah. went back and painted them. Whereas the M25 goes across most yeah. of my childhood and, um, and housing estates. And it's just, we've seen, I remember, you know, you know, being born in the 50s and seeing that change with this people going, oh yeah, let's wipe away the past. Horrible. I so went there's been a lot about that. Like, yeah. Trying to hold <clears throat> you did... You have painted Chisel Beach. Yeah, yeah. That's and something that doesn't go away. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, the, a, the, a beach which has so many connections with art. I mean, Ian McEwan did a novel on it, on Chisel mm -hmm. Beach, and mm -hmm. Bill Fontana, the sound artist, recorded the waves and played mm -hmm. them and used them. But I also it's have. Monster. I'm sorry? It's a monster, that beach. Yes. In my, you can tell me, I have got perhaps, you can tell me perhaps someone here. I keep on thinking that, is there any special link between that beach and the pre-Raphaelites? Did any? I don't know. I don't know. There might just be some sort of madness in my head. But it is a monstrous, you know, it's not really a beach, is it? You know, you want it to be a beach and you get there and you find that you, it's really hard work actually walking over there. How did you choose your angle or did you do better? Well, no, I tell you what, there's, see, no. See, I'm gonna uh, contradict myself now. Good. When, uh, Good. when I was uh, when I was a kid, we, we used to go to places like Chesil Beach mm -hmm. and Dorset for holidays, and yeah, Lulworth and all those sort of things. And uh, so it's actually wonderful going back to those places and seeing them. Not actually, they haven't changed that much because they can't really mess up something like that, you know. You know, and so. It's actually very, very nice to think that you're standing on the very spot that Constable painted them, you know, and Weymouth Bay. And you think, that's, yeah, that's great, that. Because, I don't know, has, there, has anyone been to Flatford Mill? I tried to avoid it, but, um, yeah, it's horrible, <coughs> it's horrible, really. You know, it's, a, you know, you wish... Anyway, Weymouth Bay is pretty amazing. And that's more or less how it still looks. There's a bit of change with erosion and stuff. Yeah, well, but it's you know there's some hope when you think of what you said about Spencer earlier on the landscape. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's um, well, go to Cookham, and um, yeah, I don't think there's any ordinary people left there. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, uh, it's um, Porsches and everything else, and the drives, and you know, just think, you know, the houses cost, you know. God knows, 650,000 quid, and you know, it's just madness, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. We've already overrun our time of boffle. This is a, <laughs> do, are there any questions from anybody on the floor? Because yeah. we can, we have a, a little while to do that now. If anybody does have questions, and there's a gentleman in the front row. Uh, how do you think? Well, I tell you what, if you, you know, one of the great drawers was Van Gogh. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at his drawing, well, he, he wasn't gifted. I mean, really wasn't gifted. Those ones he did in, in um, uh, Brixton. Mm. Mm. And then he, he knew he had to draw, 
he knew he needed to draw so he, 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 he resisted painting so he just spent about two and a half years drawing and I mean what he did at the end of two and a half years was absolutely amazing those pollard yeah, yeah. Stuff, you know, just because and you just look at those and you just think you, know, you just don't get to do that without hard work that's hard work yeah. that's really real devotion to 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 work he was he was 27 when he started yeah when he started yeah. 27 and and, ten you years, know, he and in 10 years ten he years. did all that work and ten it's years. just you just think he did burn himself up you know there's just ten ten years, years, you know all this things that's happened it's ten incredible years. but he is really a good example for yeah. that drawing i think you know for someone who you know he, he and also reading him as well Reading his letters, his, his, those letters tell you everything. Yeah, right. You know, I yeah, mean, you can, trend, you yeah. can you can just sort of uh, you know get a get even a, um, um, a paperback version of the, the uh, letters, and you could just open it anywhere yeah. at any period of his life, and there's something absolutely relevant to someone who's trying to draw. Yeah, within uh, the exhibition of Bank of Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. amazing how he's uh, writing all his masters. Uh, he was masters. unique. Well, I think that's a wonderful answer, an inspiring answer. You know, yeah. to think of someone who, who really, and we saw the film worked so hard. He did. It. He did. He did. He really. And what he achieved through the work. Because one of the things that he said as well, which is really important, he said, you know, he did believe that there was gifts. Yeah. He did believe that people were gifted. And it's important to believe that too, because there are people who are gifted, there are people who, but you have to work at it. You have to work really, really hard at it. In fact, if you're in the least, if you are gifted, you have to work harder at it. So, yeah, practice so, yeah. 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 make you perfect? Maybe. I don't think there's no. <laughs> I don't, yeah, that's the other thing actually. So I remember Greenham saying to me, practice. no. No, it doesn't make it because there's no such thing as perfection when it comes to, you know, there's always something wrong get with you, something. Get to yeah. better, maybe. Get to better. Man. You, and you, I, th I think, I, what I'm surprised at is, you know, I've been drawing now for a long, long, long time. And I'm just starting to get a little bit better. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pleased about that. I'm starting to get to the point a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. You know, Draw or muscle tough. Any more questions from any from from the floor? You've got in here people we might yeah. as well ask. Shoe size, anything. Next. Anything. Anything. No. Okay. Well, well then I can continue to pull you for a <laughs> for a few more minutes. For a few more minutes. I must say that. Um, looking at your sketchbooks, those that those few that are available on the internet, just I, I said I guess I was paying you a compliment. I thought I would love to take you to some of the landscapes which have been important for me mm. and for you to see what you would do with them. This is coming back to that earlier quotation about you know, art changing me. I mean, I used to live in Ethiopia and I would love you to see some of the Ethiopian landscapes. Yeah. Not only love you to see them, to see what you yeah. could do with them and how that would change my perception. Yeah. But I mean... Well, I think I've, I've heard that Ethiopia is very similar to Yemen. It is indeed. You know, so it's, I mean, it's across... Uh, sort of the Red Sea, isn't it? Yes. Is it? And I don't know whether I felt superior that I was in Yemen 15 years <laughs> before you and yeah. Charlie. Yeah, 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 but yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, um, um, I wish I'd gone there when it was first, when somebody said, you should go to Yemen. They said, no, I don't go. And then, but there is that, you know, that marvellous Yeoman's Yemen. There was the title prepackaged and ready and the literature. I didn't make that. You made that up. I didn't know. Oh, somebody, okay. else did it. somebody else did that. 
But um, uh, no, apparently the, the, the landscape is very similar. It's, 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 yeah. It is, and you don't have that. And who was it? Who's the, uh, uh, who's the great uh, Victorian explorer? Did sort of near Thessinger. Thessinger. He, 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 he said there was a lot of similarities. Yeah, yeah. The hard work, hard work walking in places like that. Tell us a little about your feelings for the Yemen, because I mean, you were very lucky to be able to go and I was there. actually, I was really lucky to go there. That's, that is good fortune. I was actually, and it was good fortune that I met Tim. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, when I was in Pakistan, I, I, I mean, I really did think, I, okay, I'll go back to England, I'll go, and I'll go to art school, and I'll go back and live in Pakistan, and I'll start working away there. And, somehow I'll send my work to London and there will be people who will be interested. And I thought, yeah, well, that's the bit that I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, bit. Can't, mm, can't quite imagine that. I'm not rich, so I can't, you know. And, I, and actually, Greenham said to me, I really don't think you should go to Pakistan. I think you should stay in this country and um, make your career in this country rather than just disappear off. So, yeah, I took his advice. And then in the 80s, I met Tim. And Tim was, you know, we almost share the same birthday. And, but he's, he's much nicer. He's, he's much more intelligent. He's, uh, he's done what I wanted to do. He's lived in this country. He can speak the language so fantastically well. He can, you know, I mean, go around with him and he's having telling jokes to shopkeepers and it's just marvellous and that he'd be talking away and I remember I was, it was an ideal opportunity for me because I could just sit there drawing and, uh, and, 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 and sometimes someone he'd be talking to is what's wrong with him, is he mute because <laughs> I wasn't saying it, because I couldn't say it but actually I I mean Tim's like a fish out of water if he can't speak the language. But for me, it was, I don't know, maybe I made it into a virtue that, um, you know, if I can't hear what they're saying, I'm not going to be affected by, by what's going on. Yeah, around. yeah. So, so I can sit there and draw, and, and if they're saying, cool, that doesn't look like anything, you know, I'm not going to think to, <laughs> I'm not going to worry. And actually, that was a big um, confidence booster to me because um, I, uh, I was really shy. Um, I remember drawing in Clissold Park in North London before I went off to India. And um, yeah, I'd be sitting on a bench and be drawing away and somebody walked out of the past and I'd shut my book. <laughs> so I didn't want them to have a book. And yet you do say that... And you know, but when you're, in, uh, when you're in a foreign country and there's all these people around, you suddenly sort of start getting brave <laughs> about things because you don't know if they're saying... <coughs> As well, the younger child, child so you're saying that you know, for you, art was a shield against the yeah, world well, impinging and the pain that it brought. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, I. I was just very insecure. You know, yeah. Very, you know. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think one of the things about that I love about drawing and painting and all, and, and anything, the, the, the way of going anyway, and doing the things I do, is that you sort of learn about yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing that you're getting from this, actually. And yes, it's good if you can do these things. And, you know, I love being in these places. But it's, you know, one of the things when I first went travelling, you expect to, when you get to Afghanistan, to feel somehow different. And you think, oh, I'm exactly the same. <laughs> I've taken all, everything from England with me over to Afghanistan. Yeah, and yeah. I haven't become a completely different person. <laughs> and, you know, so you are, you are this, you are, I think, what I really believe is that you are, when you become conscious, which is 
you're conscious of who you are at about five or six or something. It's a sort of more, you know, this is the person that you remain and all the other things are influences that come in. Outside. That's what I think. Anyway. So well, I think that we are that person of about five or six and we're learning stuff all the time. But we are essentially that person. I still feel like that person from back then. I said, don't you feel like Yes, I do, but I think that's an amazing point on which to conclude this waffle. <laughs> waffle. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. <coughs> and now, if there are no more questions, we'll call it a day. Okay. Thank you very much.